Our next speaker was actually born, the link here is that our, our next speaker was actually born on the island that our previous speaker works on. He was born in, he has a problem, he was born in Trinidad and Tobago. It's very difficult to be born in two places at once. And he also spent his deformative years in British boarding school. <laughs> so you have to forgive him. Um, so, and he's also a liar because he gave a talk title. He forced this guy, he gave him a title, forced him to give the talk to the title. And the current speaker's talk is nothing to do with his <laughs> title. So, um, so there you go. It's one of the pleasures of being an organizer. So, um, boils down to why do they do that here? <laughs> um, so, uh, I've worked on mannequins and modeling for a while, but some people just don't get it. Um, <laughs> and um, so, I think I need to start with, you know. I don't have sound. Oh, terrible. Okay, anyway, um, so I, I need to start with the basics. What is a mannequin except for this? So I do work on mannequins, but they're actually <laughs> neotropical birds. Uh, there are 51 or so species in the family, eight to go for me, Venezuela, Peru, and Brazil, and I'll be done. Um, but across the, the, the mannequins, Pipperty, they are the luckiest family in the world. Uh, you might think that uh, the birds of paradise all lack, but no, 50% of them. So mannequins are way ahead. They're by far the leckiest family of birds of any uh, organisms that I know of. 85% of them have a leck mating system where males cluster and do these outrageous displays for females. But also, interestingly, across this family, there's a spectrum of courtship display that goes from solitary to obligately cooperative. And the genera that have either incipient or obligate cooperation include Pipra, Pipra filicauda, for example, the wire-tailed mannequin, Mazius and Coropipo, really interesting ones. I've I'm, I'm got a student now working on Mazius in Ecuador. And then perhaps the highlight in the genus Carziphia, Lanceolata, that Emily Duval has worked on in Panama, and then uh, Carziphia linearis, the long-tailed mannequin that I worked on for a while in uh, Costa Rica. So they're lek mating birds. Uh, there's male-male cooperation for courtship display. It's obligate. The males sing in unison this little Toledo call, and they dance. The video that you saw at the beginning, they do this choreographed backwards leapfrog over each other. Those partners are alpha-beta partnerships that form at the top of, at each lek of eight to 15 or, or more males. Um, there's an alpha-beta partnership plus a queue of contenders, lower ranking males below them that are going to move up through the queue. Um, in my study area, for example, I might have in any one year uh, roughly a square kilometer eight to 10 alpha males at the top of each of their little leks, and only some of those are going to mate. So the variance in male mating success is staggeringly high. They live longer. They have a, a, a variance in male mating success that's like that of northern elephant seals, which are often touted as having high variance in mating success. Uh, but a long-tailed mannequin weighs 16 grams. A northern elephant seal weighs 3.6 million grams. And they live longer than northern elephant seals. Uh, beta males usually are eight or older. Uh, they're then waiting to move up on the disappearance slash death of the alpha male, who tends to be sort of 10 to 15 years old. The males are unrelated, so this is obligate cooperation without any kind of kinship. Um, I worked, did this, I, this is the ignoble we, um, I'm saying I, but you know, really, I didn't do much of the work here either. Um, uh, worked in Monteverde, Costa Rica, uh, had a roughly 80 hectare study area, basically the uh, uh, Quaker dairy farm at 1,300 meters. Over the years, we followed 16 what I call perch zones or leks or queues of males, do these two-hour observations from blinds, 
We did about, in the end, about 15,000 hours of watching these guys. And in earlier network, when I sort of got started in networks, first paper on them, was um, young males. I found that young males, and these are young and a long tail mannequin is one to five years old, are five times or so as likely to be successful five years into the future as males that have a one unit lower uh, measure of network connectivity. In this case, it was information centrality. So y we can predict whether a male's going to be a high roller by his connectivity early on. But interestingly, at the time that males are high rollers, they're not particularly well connected. And I'll actually come back to that a little bit later. I want to watch this thing because we're going to look at some of the data for this. This is what's called a buzzweent. That guy um, who showed up there. Uh, so this is an alpha beta pair, well established pair. Um, and uh, sometimes at the end of their dances, the alpha, the higher ranking male there, he faces the beta male and gives this directed, what we call a buzz wink at his partner. And um, that's a clear signal of dominance, higher ranking male to lower ranking male, often the alpha to the beta, but it could be the beta to the gamma and on down the Greek, Greek alphabet. Um, so um, I've, I've never lied except to Darren and a few other times. Um, but I, 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 I wrote things, I put things in print that I bitterly regret. For example, I said, males form orderly cues. Well, except at Lek Y, I find out. Uh, Buzzwings are never reciprocated. Uh, well, except at Lek Y. Um, males never become alphas before they're eight. It just won't happen. These males will have to wait and wait and wait to move up. Well, except at Lek Y. And worst of all, I'm sitting there watching these males, and I've said they, 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 they do their dominance interaction, but they never fight. And then these two males get into a grappling fight and fall to the ground. But no, you can't do that. I've published that you don't fight. Um, so life, life was looking pretty tough. So um, part of the, the, the uh, impetus for doing this talk is what sorts of circumstances could explain this extreme disorder at Lek Y in what is otherwise usually an orderly cooperative system. So with my graduate student, Sarah Decker, uh, who, again, this is the royal we, I'm trying to, t uh, the ignoble we, I'm trying to take the credit for all the work she's done. So this is a network of the dominance interactions uh, from 1983 to 1999, 62 birds, 160 buzzweens, these very tightly directed, this guy's doing a buzzween at that guy, or chases. Um, and what we're going to focus on is uh, those interactions, I think this is, yeah, so is particularly those two males, but other interactions here that uh, involved um, mutual back and forth, either a mutual buzzween, that was the really horrifying thing for me, the mutual buzzween, that should not happen. Um, uh, but in other cases, the mutual links there bo going both ways were a buzzwing one way and a chase the other way. Um, and all of this is centered in at Lek Y. So when we're thinking about dominance hierarchies where we have relationships, cycles are disorderly. So if we have this sort of configuration, um, A dominates B, B dominates C, and then C dominates A, that's uh, who's at the top, who's at the bottom, we don't know. Uh, this is a, an unresolved sort of dominance relationship in contrast to a transitive triangle where we have a clear top, A dominates both B and C, B dominates C and C's at the bottom. So those are, those are sort of orderly. So going back to this network, we have nine closed triangles in there and two of them are cycles. And um, again, we're going to focus on these uh, males in that, that area there. So um, 
So here we have the males. My graduate student decided she had to name all of them. I changed. I couldn't bear that one of the names she had, Sylvester and Tweety, are the two mutual <laughs> buzz readers. I couldn't handle that. So I changed them to Contender 1 and Contender 2. But um, what we see here are these, the, in this network, these three mutual back and forth things. And um, if I can get her graphics working here. Um, in an empirical dominance network, Di and I have now worked on, again, ignoble we. Di's done all the work, and I'm trying to take all the credit. But we've looked at a bunch of dominance networks, and almost always the expected in a random network is 25% cycles, and uh, published dominance data sets, 100 and more of the dominance data sets, almost never above 10% uh, cycles. So the expectation for nine cycles in the network of our size is 2.25 cycles. That would be a quarter of the nine. Uh, the observed here is we have two cycles, 22% cycles of the, the closed triangles. And for other animals, much less. So this is, this is looking a little disorderly for a guy that's claiming that mannequins behave in very orderly fashion here. Um, and the, the um, two cycles involve the arrow going that way for the first cycle there, contender one to outsider to contender two, and then another one, contender one, going the other way, his buzz went back at contender two, contender two to oddball, who's actually did another thing that was he wasn't allowed to do because I published that alpha males never leave their own home leg, and there he was showing up at Y. Um, so first thing we asked was, if we have three mutual edges in a network this size, what's the probability that they'll be scattered or clustered? So you can have three mutual edges connecting three nodes, three that zigzag across four nodes, three that are scattered across five nodes, or the most scattered configuration is you've got those mutual edges scattered separately so that it involves six different uh, birds in the network. And so with ours, we threw mutual, three mutual edges on our network 10,000 times randomly. And what we find is that the probability that they're as clustered as they are, that they all occurred at the, for those LEC Y males, is very low, P.022. So the story here, I think the basis of the story, the dynamic through time, that's the one little bit of non-lie in my title, there's a little bit of dynamics here, is looking through time at why this why why was um, disorderly is that for a long time, for uh, four solid years there, the alpha male and the beta male were the same. They were performing at very high levels, 1985, 1986, 1987, 1988. Patriarch and sidekick were there. Behind them are the other males in the queue, and a lot of those males disappeared. So the queue collapsed at the back of these males, behind these two top al uh, alpha and beta males. So that suddenly 1989, sidekick, the beta disappears. Interesting demographic problem. Betas disappear at a higher rate than alphas, which is also not, <laughs> shouldn't happen. Um, so, so from 1990 on, things get really tense at Y. Patriarch is there for the first part of the 1990 season, then youngster, this guy, again, no, you can't be an alpha male. You're only five years old. Youngster becomes the alpha male in 1990. He persists into the first half of the 1991 season. So that's why he's that red on the top there in the alpha at Y column. He's replaced by oddball. Oddball should not be there. He's the alpha at the next leck over. But things are. Females are coming into this lek, his lek not as much happening. He comes in, contends. He moves up to be the alpha male. 1992, it gets even worse. Oddball's still there, but he disappears. Now we're left really with contender one and contender two. And there in, whoops, 1993, we get uh, contender one and contender two. So looking at it as a little network diagram, I'm just going to work through this really quickly. Um, we start out in 1990 with Patriarch and Sidekick, but halfway through 1990, he disappears. It goes black. That's death. Um, 
uh, then Youngster moves from being a beta male. Oh, I don't have the legend in here, so it's even more confusing. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm very sleep deprived. Um, the, uh, the blue is beta male. So Youngster there up in the upper left there uh, moves from being the beta to the alpha halfway through the 1990 season. Notice on the outside here, we have two nodes that are not connected. Outsider and contender are actually, contender one, are actually two males at the next leck over, not at Y. And they buzz wint as should happen. Outsider is the alpha, he buzz wints at the uh, at contender one there. So there's some interactions going on. Ah, the legend, finally. So the alphas are red, the betas are blue, lower ranking males are green. And uh, if you're dead, you're black. OK, so uh, 1991, Patriarch is gone. Youngster disappears partway through the year. Now we get some interactions with Contender 1, Outsider from the other LEC coming in, hanging out at LEC Y, Contender 1, and Oddball, this male who's defected from his LEC to come over and contend for uh, uh, LEC Y. And he actually is the alpha male for the end of 1991, 1992. Youngster, Patriarch are dead. Oddball, who's come in from the other places, alpha's Alpha for the first half of the year, then he dies. He disappears. Now we have Contender 1, Contender 2, and Outsider. So it's fairly dynamic here, and there's lots of these interactions, chases, or buzzwinks. And here's 1993. Patriarch's dead, Youngster's dead, Oddball's dead, Outsider, the alpha male from the like on the other side. Now all we're left with is Contender 1 and Contender 2, or if you prefer my graduate student's description, Tweety and Sylvester. That's this cartoon. I mean, I've never even seen the cartoon. It's a cartoon where a cat and a bird fight. But you know, these are birds, so I don't want the cats in there. You've seen the, oh, you, oh how many people have heard of this? Everybody except me, okay. <laughs> Anyway, so it's Tweety, Tweety and Sylvester. All right, so there they are, 1993, death, black. Everything's going black here. And there we have this mutual buzzwink. Tweety, uh, Tweety buzzwinks at, at, at Sylvester, and Sylvester buzzwinks right back, because they really don't know each other. They haven't had time to really get a, a um, build up a relationship. OK, so this is bad. There's all this disorder. But what is the relationship between the performance? This is a lek mating species where males just do their thing and females respond to whatever they do. So performance we can measure as the number of Toledos. Toledo, Toledo, in unison every three seconds. They can do about a million of these a year. This is 500 to 600 Toledos per two-hour observation. So they're pumping out these Toledos. And at Lek Y, across from 1988 to 1998, the bars are, you know, the average rate per month um, corrected for the number of observations there. Um, we see the performance is fairly steady, and I'm going to point particularly to 93 and 94, which are in the colorblind, insensitive red there. Um, so they look grayish. So there's shades of gray. Anyone colorblind and can actually see the difference in the bars? No one's admitting it. OK. Um, uh, so that's performance. That's one index of performance by the males. What's the response? Female visits are, are pretty good. We've had patriarch and sidekick rolling along for a number of years there. Female visits are pretty good up till they, they take a dive in 1991. They rebound a little bit in 92. And then they really tank. 93, 94 are the years where Tweety and Sylvester, oh, I'm so sad about those names. <laughs> Tweety and Sylvester are doing the mutual buzz weaning. So the female visits drop off. Now, female visits are a response to these Toledos. But females that have copulated at a perch tend to sort of come back there. They'll come back after the alpha male disappears. They're not choosing the male. They're choosing the long-term high performance and dancing there. And so for copulations, they actually peaked a little bit later. Um, females are still getting that response, and females are still coming in to LEC Y, even though 90 was already starting to get a little disrupted. And it's not till 93 that copulations really drop off there 
um, things are bad, the females are actually avoiding it. Um, and I would argue that the, the, the drop-off there is to do not with the performance, the Toledos are keeping going. So let's look at another lack and compare performance against for female response. So this is Barranca lack, another lack in our study area. Uh, Toledo's rose to a peak. These guys were on a super roll from sort of 92 to 95 in terms of number of Toledo's. They were really pumping out the Toledo's. Um, and female visits track those Toledo's really well, better than at Lac Y, where they dropped off when the males started fighting. Um, and we can see this slower buildup. There's a lag in the female response in terms of copulating. They'll come in and visit. They'll visit multiple LECs, but they only, we've only ever, in, again, I've said this, now I'm going to be proven wrong, only ever seen a female copulate at one perch in a given season. And in fact, most times where we see them copulate in a given season, they'll be with that perch for the next few years also. They tend to be very sight faithful. They're slow about making up their minds where to mate, but once they do, they sort of stick with it. Okay, so I want to tie that idea of the disruption to the trajectories of how male relationships develop over time. And so for doing this, what I'm looking at is just a two-year social network, and this is all the interactions. This is affiliative interactions where they're sitting together right next to each other or singing together. Um, so for 1989, 1990, I had 35 banded birds. That creates the possibility of 595 dyads. And what we're looking at is for the dyads, an index of tie strength. So these are weighted ties. How often are they interacting across these 595 dyads? Now, this is a sparse network, so 522 of the possible 595 uh, dyads didn't interact at all in that two-year period. So a lot of the dyads weren't interacting. There were 31 dyads, and these are mostly young males, where the tie strength, they did interact, but the tie strength was weak. They interacted very few times. It's tie strength, not number. It's not a direct thing because I'm waiting for observer effort there. So there's 31 dyads that way. Um, and I would diagram that as these are young males, these colors in the color scheme I have. That this goes with a different talk, so I haven't described the color scheme. But these are young males, pre-definitive in the light blue, green or um, um, dancer males, and blue are definitive males, males in the red, black, and blue plumage. Um, so those are lower status categories. Um, and then there's only one tie strength 80, way out there on the x-axis. There was one pair of males. They were the alpha and beta at, they were uh, side uh, patriarch and sidekick at Y. Every time we went to their perch for an observation, we saw them. So they were, they had a very, very high tie strength as illustrated by that line. That line is 80 pixels thick, so it looks like a box instead of a line. The, the point being that what there is is an interesting perspective, uh, transition in the way ties work in these, in these mannequin networks. Young males, have many, they have high degree. They have many ties to other males, but those ties are weak. They interact rarely with many males. Older males, particularly top alphas and betas, are busy. They don't have time to hang with the guys because they're busy dancing for females, so older males have low degree, few, few ties to other males, but the ties they do have are very strong. They're always interacting with their alpha or beta partner. Um, so there's a, a sort of interaction there, and I think part of capturing the dynamics of this will be getting at this stability, the buildup of these stable relationships between males. Anyway, back to why, I think the, the, the take home message is he, here is that conflict has a cost. Cooperative males build up a reputation that females respond to. And conflict has a cost because it jeopardizes the reputation of the lack. So interestingly, um, John Maynard Smith in one of his publications argued that, not, that orderly cues in non-human animals are unlikely because 
the individual at the end of the queue has nothing to lose by disruption. You can only move upward, right? Except in the case of long-tailed mannequins, the males at the end of the queue do have something to lose because they, the bus won't stop. If the queue is disorderly, the females won't come back. So the males, even at the end of the queue, have a vested interest in the reputation of the lek. And I tested that experimentally. Luckily, I had done an experiment. Darren is saying that you know, it's worthless if you don't do experiments. I did do <laughs> one experiment. Um, and that was taxidermic mount experiments. And the interesting thing was that the males that were most reactive to the taxidermic mounts were not the alpha and beta. They were busy singing for females, were the lower ranking males. Those are males whose place in the queue could be jeopardized and whose, whose future is all about the reputation that they're going to inherit when they move up in five or six years. So what we have, I think, at Y is an example of a demographic collapse. So I do think it is rare. I think the system is normally much more orderly. But Y was a really interesting exception where, because of the demographic collapse of the bottom end of the queue, the queue became short, very young. We have a youngster at age five, an alpha that shouldn't be an alpha at that age. He also burned out quickly interesting problem of males not being ready for moving up in rank that led to this breakdown of orderliness. Um, so next steps, oh. Where I was stopping by just for a drink. We're gonna turn frustration into inspiration. Such is the method of tribal connection. So. I'm hoping that the rest of this conference will be building up some of this tribal connection. Uh, what I'd like to do, what Sarah, my student, and I would like to do is further quantify, get at the stability of these cues. Stability can mean so many different things. So I'd be love to talk to people about that. I'd like to link the demography more explicitly to the cue structure. Um, and interestingly, I think the demo I need to go back over the demographic data, but I think I have hints of some epizootic years where mortality should be, these guys live a really long time. Top eight, five, six, seven year old males have very, very high survival rates, but some years seem to um, have higher mortality rates. And then better model these transitions from the many weak ties of young males to the very a uh, few strong ties of older males. I'd like to work on ways to do that. And then I'd like to catch up with the Trinidad, my fellow Trinidadians at the bar. <laughs> so with that, I'll uh, end, and I think there's time for questions, but is anybody <laughs> checking the time or <laughs> the schedule? <laughs> Thanks.